on This Week in Enterprise Tech, UEFI in the Enterprise. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 133, recorded March 27th, 2015. UEFI in the Enterprise. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by PagerDuty. PagerDuty decreases alerting noise for IT operations and developers to ensure that the right engineers are notified at the right time. Increase your uptime and sign up for a 14-day free trial at pagerduty.com slash twit. And by Ring Central, the business phone system that's in the cloud. Ring Central now integrates with Google for work. Try Ring Central with a 30-day risk-free trial. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. And by ZipRecruiter. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free, plus get 30% off your first traffic boost by going to ziprecruiter.com slash twiet. That's ziprecruiter.com slash twiet. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm not guiding you by myself. I'm joined by my regular cast of cohorts, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Although, Brian, that doesn't look much like Honolulu. No, I'm in uh, the San Francisco, greater San Francisco area, and we are at a big warehouse building the interop net. And uh, we'll be talking about what that interop net is in just a bit, but someone else who is no longer where he's supposed to be, but I think is in a different warehouse, is Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, you seem to be f surrounded by spools of things. That's right. I'm, I'm here in the party warehouse uh, where the Interopnet and SDN Lab are coming together. It's uh, nothing but fun, fun, fun here 24-7. There we go. My co-hosts in warehouse, never shall the two meet. Let's get straight in to the blips. This first one is, uh, well, a little sad because there's no security for booth babes. Now, scantily clad women adorning the latest greatest thingamabob from whatever technology company was the hallmark of every major male-dominated enterprise and consumer tech conference from Interop to CES to Black Hat, well, at least in the 80s and the 90s. Now at least one major conference is living in the new millennium by officially banning booth babes from the show floor. At RSA 2015, the world's premier cryptography conference, exhibitors and staff are required to wear business-appropriate attire, specifically ruling out cleavage tops, miniskirts, lycra, and objectional costumes. While the phenomenon of the booth babes has largely been in decline for the last decade, it's nice to know that some serious tech conferences will be appealing to cooler heads. <laughs> HP aims a new rack at OpenStack developers. If you need to build your own private cloud, HP has a system for you. HP has launched a Helion rack offering that comes pre-configured with OpenStack cloud software combined with the Cloud Foundry development platform. Now, HP isn't the first vendor to offer a pre-configured private cloud system, but it does have a unique position in the market. HP is the sole public cloud service provider that is also a major supplier of x86 servers, giving the company a shot at shipping pre-configured servers compatible with its Helen public cloud. The new rack is based on standard HP ProLiant DL360 Gen 9 servers and is equipped with HP FF5700 switching. Helian OpenStack can support up to 100 compute nodes, with each node running up to 40 virtual machines. For companies trying to decide how to move apps to the cloud, 
the new Hellion system offers some very exciting new possibilities. Well, oops, PayPal to pay $7.7 million of a fine over mishandling how they handle U.S. sanctions. Seems PayPal hasn't been checking their transaction requests against a specific list of enemies of the country, according to an article from Reuters. Seems they process transactions for folks that are listed as weapons of mass destruction proliferators and as a result is paying this fine as part of a settlement that includes changes in the way they process future transactions. It, however, doesn't go as far as admitting wrongdoing. Hey, recruiters who use social media, well, guess what? You need to up your game. Forrester, Ogilvy, and several other research and analysis firms have been following a troubling trend for recruiters, the fall off of social media recruiting. Now, their respective reports at all point, at least on the surface, to a decreasing ROI from recruiting new hires from social media outlets. However, a deeper dive into the data seems to suggest that social media recruiting is still quite mm -hmm. alive and well, and that the only companies that invest too much in a single platform are feeling the sting of oversaturation. Mm -hmm. The bottom line, you can still find great engagement through social media if you're a recruiter, but your campaigns need to be catchier, your net needs to be larger, and your reach needs to be more inclusive. Welcome to the world of net neutrality. Uh, lawsuits, that is. Well, that didn't take very long. U.S. Telecom, a broadband industry trade group, and Alamo Broadband from, guess what, Texas, <clears throat> each filed a federal lawsuit claiming that the FCC had done any number of things wrong in its new direction for network neutrality. Given where the lawsuits and the topics they addressed, come from, it doesn't seem likely that major changes will come because of them, but they do seem very effective as harbingers of lawsuits yet to come. If we don't know the final shape of net neutrality, we do finally have a pretty good idea of where FCC lawyers are going to spend an awful lot of their time in the coming years. Well, my next blip is how Salesforce's CEO Mark Benioff announced plans to avoid Indiana for any future company events following the passage of Senate Bill 101 called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The cloud computing giant CEO announced on his Twitter account stating that his employees and customers outrage over this act. The outrage is being followed by dramatically reducing any company investments in the state to hammer down his point that this legislation is discriminatory and announces the start of what he describes as a set of slow rolling sanctions to encourage Indiana to rethink this decision. Wow, just wow. While I applaud his involvement, I do wonder if this flexing of corporate muscles is just the first shot of corporations becoming even more blatant at browbeating legislators when laws are passed that they don't agree with. I don't like the act, but is this a slippery slope? According to web metrics company Computer World, one in seven Windows PCs will be running Microsoft's Project Spartan browser within a year end of, of its launch of Windows 10. It's taking into account its own previous projections for Windows 10 adoption, as well as trends for Internet Explorer, Computer World calculates that the free upgrades for Windows 7 and 8 and better means that Microsoft's newest browser could bag 23.6% of browser statistics as reported by Net Applications, which translates into a 14.4% share. Of course, the real question is, if Project Spartan can distance itself enough from the reputation of IE to become more than just the installation point of a third-party browser. Well, that's it for the blips. We're going to get straight into the bites. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And of course... It's got to be pager duty. Now, the tech that we use in the enterprise gets more and more reliable each and every single year. Servers will fail over automatically. Switches will route around outages. And storage has redundancy for redundancy of redundancies. But no matter how sophisticated our equipment gets, no matter how smart our tools become, things still break. And they typically break when you least expect it. So we want a solution that can wake us from a deep slumber when we need to deal with the issues before they become problems. PagerDuty is that solution. It's an operations performance platform that delivers visibility and actionable intelligence to help increase the uptime of your apps, servers, websites, and databases. 
Now, PagerDuty connects all of your systems into a single view, allowing you to see critical events across all your monitoring tools. It's an essential service if your business needs your software and services to always be up. It has over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, Keynote, App Dynamics, or you could roll your own with the easy-to-use PagerDuty APIs. You can customize it to how you work instead of having your team work the way the tool does. Now, here's how it actually works. When there's an incident, PagerDuty will first look through all your monitoring tools, filters, and deduplicate the alerts. Only then will it alert the proper staff. This reduces the noise and false alerts to make sure that only actionable alerts are delivered. After reducing that noise, PagerDuty checks on-call schedules and personalized alerting preferences to automatically alert the right team and team member. Now, those alerts are dispatched by automated phone calls, SMS, email, and push notifications. PagerDuty is a distributed service across multiple data centers and multiple hosting providers, so your people will never miss an alert. However, if alerts are missed by an individual who can't get to his or her communication device at a given time, PagerDuty will automatically escalate issues to another team member until the problem is taken care of. All of this means one thing. Your problems get solved in time. Now, of course, PagerDuty isn't just content to tell you about what they do. You should probably take a look at the customers that use PagerDuty, that trust PagerDuty to guide their companies. Their tools are trusted by Microsoft, GitHub, Boeing, Nike, Pinterest, and Box. If they trust those tools to be proactive, shouldn't you too? So here's what we want you to do. We want you to get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. And when you sign up for a new account, you'll also get a free t-shirt. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. pagerduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get over to the bites. This first one is a doozy for anyone who might be a business traveler. A research team from Sidelance has discovered that a wireless gateway that is very popular with hotels and conference centers is vulnerable to an exploit that allows for remote code execution with very, very little effort. A silence is not yet listing the names of the vulnerable devices in order to give time for those hotels and conference centers to patch their affected networks, but they hinted that the affected units are installed up and down the spectrum of cost from the smallest hotel no-tells to the hotels that cost more per night than most apartment rents. Now, that's covering 277 gateway routers made by Ant Labs and deployed in over 29 different countries. The vulnerability is called CVW-2015-0932, and it gives read and write access to the router file system through an, get this, unauthenticated rsync daemon, daemon at TCP-873. Now, I, I want to throw this over to you first, Tiebert, because you know, I think the first point we should make here is our listeners, Twiat listeners, the Twiat Riot, the, the loyal members of the Twit Army have nothing to fear because they've been taking our advice for the last few years and they've been using a VPN at all times when on a public wireless network. But this is still actually pretty big, right? Oh, yeah. This is, uh, there's, no, there's really no excuse. Come on. An unauthenticated rsync demon and it's publicly available. Uh, excuse me. Sanity check here. So, for those of you that aren't running an SSL VPN or a VPN service of some sort, what is your problem? Come on, it's not that hard. You know, I'm a big Sonic Wall fan, and every single Sonic Wall sold in the last five years comes with at least one SSL VPN license, and you can configure it for tunnel all so that your entire traffic gets tunneled to your home network where it then appears. Not on the vulnerable hotel networks. Come on, it, this is not hard anymore. This is not expensive anymore. Your excuses are going away. All right, now, Curtis, there is a patch for this vulnerability and it's actually, it's a very simple patch. It's been available for a while, but what this research firm is claiming is that there is no way to tell whether or not the patch has been installed. I mean, you can't check the version of the software that's running the, the, the router slash gateway so you just have to assume that every router that you use, every gateway that you log into has this vulnerability. 
Well, there, there are two things I would say. First of all, given the general level of security of these routers, I'm sure it would only be so difficult to check that if you really wanted to. But in general, I think you're absolutely right. And the only safe thing to do is assume that every router you attach to is unpatched. You know, assume that every hotel router is dangerous um, until proven otherwise. And since it's very difficult to prove a negative, that just means assume that every hotel Wi-Fi access point is dangerous. I mean, let's face it. Uh, I'm staying at a decent hotel out here, and um, last night they couldn't access the closet that contained the light bulb required to change the light bulb in my bathroom. Uh, I don't think it's rational to assume they're going to be able to get to the Wi-Fi routers and uh, the access points to make sure they're updated. Um, assume they're dangerous, convenient, but very dangerous. Kind of like, uh, you know, the worst kind of anonymous Uber in the sketchy part of town. Right, right. You know, Achiever, one of the things that always bothers me about these stories is because we're hearing more and more of them. And, and most of us have the common sense to not trust a public Wi-Fi network or a public wired network with any sensitive information. And, and I think the, the word about VPNs is getting, is getting out there. Something I saw at the Enterprise Connect conference, which really bothered me, was there was a very popular VPN solution that was, that was in use in the hotel, and I won't name it, uh, but... By default, it wouldn't tell you if the VPN had died because it assumed that you wanted to maintain session. So it would just automatically try to reconnect any connections that had died when the VPN went down, and then it would try to reestablish the VPN in the background, which that really disturbed me because that's almost more dangerous because now you think you have an encrypted session, and in the meantime, if I was going to be running remote code on this this router or wireless gateway, I would kill VPNs and I would I would sniff the traffic right after I had killed the VPNs to see if I could glance anything usable. Um, th why why is it that some VPN manufacturers don't seem to, to to take security so seriously? You know I don't know this this old saying: buy them books, send them to school, teach them to read. What do you do? You know it's not like this. This hasn't been around for a while. The, it, the best practices is, for God's sakes, if your VPN drops and you're unprotected, start at least making blinky, blinky lights. You know, just tell people that the VPN's dropped. You know, this whole thing is just not really great. Um, I know everybody is so desperate to make money, but come on. There's also such a thing as product liability. You know, maybe this is something Denise needs to cover. You know, is there product liability when you leave a customer vulnerable without telling them that they're no longer protected? You know, it's like, ah, oh, come on, guys. Not hard. Not rocket science. All right. Well, let's go ahead and step away from that because we could go down the rabbit hole of rants about uh, security policy. And instead... I Chibert, I want to spend some time talking about where the two of you are right now, which normally I would be at if I wasn't so contagious, uh, which is Interop, the hot stage for Interop. Now, people who have watched Twite before, they understand that we have a strong connection to Interop. In fact, that's how the three of us met uh, at an Interop event. Interop started off as a collaborative effort between some engineers in the Silicon Valley. This was way back when we had competing networking standards that did not like each other. They may have the same physical ports. They may have even been named after the same technologies, but they were so often inter uh, non-interoperable. These engineers got together at a cafe in Monterey. Uh -huh. They brought out their boxes. They opened up their source code to, to other engineers, which was a no-no. They shouldn't have done that, according to, to corporate. And they decided we're going to make ways for all of our gear to interoperate with everyone else's gear. Uh, and that's that was really the foundation of Interop. And that's really, if you think about it, the foundation of networking as we know it today. But my question to you first, Hubert, is what what keeps Interop going? Why do you show up every year? Why do, why do we show up every year? Uh, a lot of what Interop is to me is a learning community. It is first and foremost an educational experience um, for a lot of the engineers. It's also a community. The ability to talk to people that have designed the product, uh, talk to people that own the product line, 
being able to get the unvarnished truth, the back channels, the personal relationships so that if I manage to paint myself into a corner, I have someone to call. My favorite saying in the world whenever I teach a class is the best network engineers aren't the ones that know it all. They're the ones that know who to call. And Interop, first and foremost for me, is a community of some absolutely amazing talents. And of course, it's also my annual dosage of humble pie. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that humble pie because uh, I, not people don't get it if they've never been to Interop uh, and if they've never worked in the NOC. That NOC is filled with people, some of which are responsible for the foundational technologies that run the internet, that run the, the entire industry that we're working in today. The, the amount of experience that is inside a typical interop knock is absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, you can actually, you can walk up to people and say, hey, can you tell me a little bit about when Ethernet became a standard? And they'll, they'll give you the blow-by-blow. Blow. What are some of the things that you find on a regular basis that, that pique your interest and then draw you in? Because that's really who gets attracted to working as a volunteer at interop. It's the people who, who just, they just want to learn. They want to soak up everything. Oh, well, you know, there's like, for instance, I'm responsible this year and like last year is we're trying to put together um, a whole bunch of classes just for the volunteers. Because keep in mind, even though we're calling these people volunteers, they also tend to be um, people that are uh, IT managers, MIS managers, people like that. They're, they're talented. They are, you know, the big fish in their pool. But these people come because they want to learn from other fish in other pools. Um, being able to go and talk to people that, like, for instance, my favorite story is I actually walked up and said, you know, dude, I, I can't get this um, connection running on your server. And he goes, oh, you know, I knew that might happen. And the guy actually opens up the source code, modifies the driver for a prototype gigabit Ethernet driver on a workstation, recompiles it and calls it, you know, blah, 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 dash Carl and throws it up onto a TFTP server and says, yeah, I'll try, give this a try. This is really, really typical of the InteropNet engineering team. People that have written the standards. Um, at one time, we, we took the time and effort to go and search through all the names of the uh, request for comments, the standards of the internet. And at that point in time, the Interop engineering team, both the past engineers and the current engineers, were responsible for in excess of 53% of the RFCs on the current internet. That's a pretty staggering number for one organization. This organization, I believe, in my mind, has been more responsible for the changes in the industry than any single other organization because we've taken things that have just come out and try to make them work in the real world and create this gorgeous feedback loop so that as things don't work, we find out why and feed that back to the corporations. Dash Carl. That didn't happen to be Dash Carl Auerbach, did, did it? No, no. I believe that one was um, Carl Zwanzig, a.k.a. Oh, okay. Z-Bang. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a big team going through Interrupt. Actually, I just, I just made a connection here. Some of the latest and greatest in consumer technology has been about using uh, internet-connected things in order to monitor different things going on with your body. And I'd say Interop was even uh, ahead of that game because didn't wasn't there a project once to connect someone's chair to the internet so we could tell exactly what kind of heat we were getting from his body? Yes, it was called the Neil Allen Data Seat, Data Seat Project, a.k.a. NADS. Uh, I was doing a sensor project for the uh, for DARPA, and I had these teeny tiny little um, button sensors. It was both a battery and a thermal sensor. So we went and embedded that in um, Neil Allen's chair in the knock and recorded the temperature of Neil throughout the show. And uh, we actually did a class and displayed the... Uh, the graph of his temperature over the entire show. It was uh, more than just a little funny. I have it, folks. The smart watch, it ain't nothing. What we need is the smart seat. Uh, Curtis, let me ask you, because you approach Interop from a slightly different angle. Uh, you know, again, you, you deal mostly with executives. You deal mostly with the top-level decisions. Why do you keep coming back to Interop year after year? Because the naysayers will say, look, networking is a commodity. What you do 
everyone can do now. And there's nothing special about box A over box B other than maybe there's a couple of speed boosts that you've integrated into your tech. But what makes Interop attractive to someone in your position or the people that you report to? Well, the, the truth is that in order to explain things to an executive, I have to have a pretty good understanding of what's going on at a much deeper level. If I don't have that, then I run the risk of explaining things incorrectly. And that's just something I can't afford to do professionally. It's something that my readers depend on me not to do. So what I get out of this is a number of things. The, the main one <clears throat> is that I can talk to the people who are incredibly smart, people who are incredibly knowledgeable about all this technology and find out why much of it, even if it is at the commodity level, is still important. Another thing that I get to do is kind of recharge my batteries. You know, I talked to someone a couple of days ago who described this, um, well, hot stage in particular, but interop in general, as almost a summer camp for geeks. It's where the networking geek tribe comes together every year. I get to recharge my batteries because even though I, I am a journalist and I do spend most of my time talking with executives, I do have some, uh, some small amount of geek cred. I, I have worked uh, doing embedded control. I have written software. I love to get in there and recharge my excitement batteries about what's going on. So Interop does a lot of things for me. Um, Ultimately, though, the answer that I give is the answer that most of the Interop uh, team, Interop Net team members have given when I've asked them why they keep coming back. It's the people. Uh, these are just some great, very knowledgeable, very smart, incredibly sharing people uh, who will, will explain things, who aren't afraid to try and put things in language that other people can understand. And uh, I wouldn't miss that for the world. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the Interop update. Uh, when we come back, we're going to welcome back to the show a, a good friend of the Twit TV network, my personal security guru, Mr. Steve Gibson. That's right. He's going, to, he's going to be coming on to This Week in Enterprise Tech to discuss some of the ramifications for the enterprise of UEFI. But before we get there, let's go ahead and take another break to thank the second sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's got to be Ring Central. Now, Ring Central as a phone system is like calling the internet a series of tubes. It just doesn't do, do it justice because Ring Central brings together all your communication tools in the cloud. It's voice, fax, text, conferencing, high def video, pretty much everything that you need, every method that you might use to communicate with someone else, Ring Central will give you in one easy to use platform. It's an effective way of communicating in the cloud. And we love it. We love communicating with Ring Central, and we think you will too. Now, Ring Central does all the things that I want out of my communications package. It integrates with both iOS and Android devices so that your team can stay connected from anywhere, no matter what device they're using. Ring Central lets you keep your existing numbers, use toll free numbers, local extensions, and even vanity numbers. You can easily customize your system from a web browser or from their mobile apps. So it works the way that you want it to work. And if you're worried about privacy, well, just don't. Because your calls are encrypted and private with secure voice. Customer support is free 24-7, and there are no set of fees or activation fees. Now, brand new, RingCentral just announced RingCentral for Google. Now you can integrate your company's Google for Work accounts with RingCentral. It becomes one seamless communications hub. With Ring Central for Google, your staff can use the dial pad on your screen to make calls from your Gmail account. Click on any number on the screen in Gmail contacts or calendars to place a call, just like you would on your smartphone, to listen to voicemails directly within Gmail. Plus, you get faxing from Google Drive, viewing text messages, scheduling conference calls, and oh, so much more. Again, customer support is free and 24-7, and it's something that you should try if you're serious about communicating. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Ring Central. It starts at under $25 a month per user, and you can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial. Plus, here's a special for Twit listeners. For every desk phone you buy, you get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Visit ringcentral.com 
or call 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. That's 800-543-9980 or the promo code TWIT. And we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's welcome back to the show. It's been a while since he has graced our stream, Mr. Steve Gibson. That's right, the <laughs> security guru himself. Steve, it is so good to have you back. Since I have greased your stream? What is that? Is that a new expression? I think, I'm not okay, I, that, I, that was supposed to come out as graced, but the <laughs> brain is not connected to the mouth at all times. But grease the stream, that works too, I think. Uh, okay, I'm happy to be back. <laughs> Glad to be with you guys. Now, Thank you, Bert and Chris. Oh, uh, Curtis. I asked you to come on specifically because the, there is something that is it's becoming a growing concern within the enterprise. I've heard it. Every once in a while, we'll get some feedback, either over Twitter or in email, about people wanting to know about what UEFI is going to do for deployment within the enterprise. And this is, this is a very, very valid uh, 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 concern. Now, we know that UEFI was created because we had outgrown the BIOS. But could you give us a quick rundown of why we had outgrown the BIOS and why we needed UEFI? Okay, so to, to back up a little bit and sort of address your, your thesis that this is potentially a problem for the enterprise, just imagine a group of IT professionals who are already like at their limit dealing with the existing infrastructure of of heterogeneous or homogeneous systems and servers and, and workstations and all that, and then adding something that has about an additional million settings, um, like to every single one of these pieces of equipment. It's it's crazy. So so in the beginning, we had a cute little simple motherboard that you could put up to 640 megabytes of RAM on um, called the IBM PC and then its, its larger brother, the XT, which introduced hard disk storage. There was a simple BIOS, uh, which stands for basic IO system, input output system, where the BIOS used the processor, the BIOS firmware, used the processor when the motherboard powered up to initialize the state of the I.O. peripherals. It would, it would sort of, uh, the, the, the hard drive controller would have its initialization ROM, uh, you know, so-called option ROM that it would bring along because the ROM knew about the controller it was mounted on. So the BIOS would run the initialization ROM to get the hard to get, get the hard drive hardware sort of up and going. And, you know, serial ports had to have registers set and baud rates set. The parallel port had to be initialized. Video had ha, had to have its, its, its frequency registers set for the display. And the, the RAM, the video RAM, had to be wiped to all spaces so that the screen would come out blank, not looking like some sort of an explosion in a Confederate factory. So... The BIOS did all of those things to sort of get everything ready for the operating system. Then it would go and boot the OS. So while it was doing a lot, it was comparatively simple. Because, I mean, we had things like cassette input and output ports on the original IBM PC. You know, serial ports, parallel port, later a hard disk drive, um, a, a hard disk controller, Cassette I.O., oh, there's the keyboard and video. And that was it. There, there was a real-time clock, but nothing more. It was comparatively really simple. And then the idea was that once it was running, DOS would not use the hardware. That is, it would not directly touch the hardware. All of the hardware would be accessed through the BIOS, um, making... Uh, technically, now we have the term HAL, a hardware abstraction layer. The idea being that the BIOS would say, oh, you don't really need to know where the video RAM is, OS, because you're not going to touch it. You're going to ask me to put a string somewhere, and I'll put that into the video, the messy video RAM and handle all those details. And in fact, there were, in the early days, some really weird sort of PC variants 
which DOS would run on even though their hardware was very different because the BIOS on the weird PC hardware knew how to make it look like a standard BIOS interface. So decades go by and and now we've got systems that are monitoring power supply voltages to make sure that all of the nine different voltages our crazy processors need are within limits and what their currents are. We've got fans in the back and fans in the front. We've got fans in the middle. They're all having to have their RPMs measured and they're changing their speed in order to balance the temperature management of, of, of the system. We've got rate arrays. We've got switches on the chassis to see if anybody has opened it up and maybe changed something. You know, we, we all have built-in NICs now, network interface cards, basically on the motherboard, multiples of those. Those are running at, at different speeds and need to be initialized. We've got a, a power ma management that the old PC didn't have where the thing can be hibernated or standed by. It, 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 it can be shut down warm. Even when the system is not running, as, as, as anyone who's built PCs recently knows, there's still lights blinking on the motherboard and you've got network activity going on. It's like, wait a minute, the computer's off yet it still seems to be on. It's because unless you actually unplug it, it's still alive. So what's happened is there's this massive explosion in the complexity of, of, the, of the hardware, of the motherboard and chassis and all the management system. You know, uh, corporations want to be able to do electronic inventory, reach out and get serial numbers of devices and hardware. We've got redundant power supplies that have to do soft failover. I mean, it's just gone crazy. So the old BIOS has been outgrown a long time ago. And what's been happening happening now since around mid-1990s is this the evolution of the replacement, which is the UEFI, the Universal Extensible Firmware Interface. Now, why why would we have to move to that? I mean, I, I understand, okay, we've, we've outgrown the BIOS. Obviously, when the BIOS cr was created, it didn't have nearly as many inputs, sensors, and, and add-ons as, as it did as we got to the end of the BIOS era. But why go with UEFI as it was designed? Because it, it, it seems as if it was a good idea to create something that was more flexible, more extensible than BIOS, but then they added in on all these things that when you look at the total sum just seems to make configuration a nightmare. So, so it's, it's a long-standing problem of computer science in general that you, you sort of, you think you know what you want when you start. And as they all, you know, the famous expression is no plan of battle ever survives first contact with the enemy, um, which is to say that a year after you're using your system, you realize there are a lot of other things you wish it could do. And, and, and the, the, the philosophy of the way the system was first designed can generally be extended a little bit. You can say, oh, look, well, we're using interrupts. Uh, you know, interrupt 10 is for video BIOS, interrupt 13 is for disk, interrupt 8 is for keyboard. Uh, we can, but we now we need power management. Let's use 19. Well, before long, you run out. So my point is that it's always the case in computer science that you can extend your original concept only to a certain point and it just sort of begins to collapse. And at some point, you have to start over. And... Unfortunately, whereas the original PC was just created by a little team down in Boca Raton, Florida, and it's like, oh, look at this, you know, this works. By the time we got into the mid-1990s, it was an industry. We had, you know, hundreds of players. And when the announcement was made, oh, uh, let's replace the BIOS with something new. Everybody had something they wanted. I mean... I mean, weird little chips in the corner said, oh, let's talk to this little weird chip in the corner. And so you, it, it became this massive, large, top-heavy, like crazy complex infrastructure, um, the classic design by committee sort of thing. It is extremely powerful. It does everything anyone could ever even think to that it might someday need to do. And that's what we're saddled with today. Now, of course, Steve, the, the implication for the enterprise and the reason why we're talking about it on Twiat is 
one of the things that you can do with UEFI is the safe boot, which can essentially lock out other operating systems from any particular box that you buy. It's not like the old days where you could choose your parts and choose your OS and everything will work well together. In fact, we've got both Curtis B and Almost Networking in the chat room asking essentially the same question, which is, why wouldn't you just have BIOS handle booting and then do the hardware abstraction in something that loads, a driver stack that loads like they do in, uh, in Linux? Why do you have to build all that into the hardware, which could then be used to, to really limit what you can run on the hardware you've purchased? Yeah, that's a great question. The reason is that a lot of this functionality is pre-OS. It is stuff that runs without an operating system running on top, for example, or, or it is used to boot the OS, like booting over the network. If you're going to boot the operating system over the network, then something before the operating system has to know how to do network communications. It has to have high-level protocols. It has to have a, a TCP IP stack. It, it often, in fact, the UFEI does have a full IPsec style you know, IPv6 support and IPsec security built in. So there's a whole nother infrastructure aside from the OS. And the reason, the, 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 the other reason that's done, not only do you need this stuff before the operating system is even running, but the, 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 the UEFI still has that role of performing some, some hardware independence. There is a, a there are a set of, APIs that the UEFI supports, which the OS can know about, that means that you don't need, I mean, like a, a ridiculous number of little itty bitty drivers for itty bitty chips scattered all over the motherboard. At, at some point, it doesn't make sense to require that kind of driver load for the OS. And remember, there are now many different operating systems. And so if you didn't build UEFI drivers once, then you'd be forced to build those drivers for every different operating system that, that wanted to run, run on that motherboard. So there, there is still some logic in, in having some, some OS independence, having an API in the motherboard that is able to worry not i mean not about the big things not like the hard drives for example the os will absolutely take that over and bypass the uefi and and same thing for video but all the little sort of maintenancey things voltages and currents and fan speeds and stuff doesn't make sense to duplicate those drivers for every os that's something that ha having the motherboard responsible for and able to talk to the os all the os's through a through a common an interface makes sense. Uh, Steve, I'm going I'm to have you talk about Safe Boot in just a bit. Let's, let's dive into that. But before we do that, I, I want to bring in my co-host here. Uh, let's start with you, Chibert. Uh, let's let's take it from the IT manager perspective. I'll ask Curtis from the IT exec perspective in just a bit. UEFI, when I've been doing deployments over the last six months, has been a pain in the butt if it's not configured properly because a lot of my mass deployment tools no longer work properly. Uh, is is this something that you've run into at all at the university? Well, you, the mass deployment tools do work, just not all of them. They right. have to be able to write to the new standards. But more importantly, the thing I want to point out is UEFI, of course, was designed by committee, so obviously has the flaws of a designed by committee system. But the key piece that I want to point out is UEFI lays the foundations for a chain of trust going from the hardware all the way up into the operating system. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some people have, you know, remembered the fake ATMs and the fake um, card readers that people have put on to, like, gas pumps. Uh, things like UEFI would not allow foreign devices um, to be happening. There's, it, you know, that might be a bad ex uh, analogy, but the ability to control the, the entire chain of command so that you can't add things without breaking that chain or triggering um, alerts is a very important thing. Because remember, we're now in a world where we're trusting less and less. Uh, we need to have more trust in our, our platforms. Um, the only thing that I... I'm kind of 
pissed off about is UEFI hasn't always done a really good job of helping out the open source people. The Linux distros, some of the big players have it, but what about the little guys? Uh, for something like UEFI to really work and be able to be widely adopted, UEFI has to be a lot easier to implement, and it can't just be for the big boys. Right. And Curtis, I want to throw over to you. Chibert brought up something very important. That's the chain of trust. And every time I've heard a UEFI positive presentation, it's always been based on this chain of trust. That seems to be very attractive to people in positions like a CTO or CIO, this idea that all the machines that are in my network, I have a level of control over that I would not have had before. Someone can just uh, load up a rogue OS that now starts to slurp everything off my network. I at least have the, the ability to say all the OSs that are running, my team, my team allowed. Uh, it, is that a selling point at all? Have, have you discussed UEFI much to your, your executive crowd? Well, not really UEFI in particular, but the whole notion of the chain of trust is something that our readers care about because, among other things, the chain of trust gives them the ability to, to tell the various security and regulatory auditors that they have maintained this chain of accountability that extends from the hardware to the user to the to the network to the the overall IT infrastructure and that's critically important for all kinds of reasons but the big one gets back to this notion of where does trust end once upon a time we could convince ourselves that at the very least all the pieces within a box, all the pieces within a particular PC were trustworthy amongst themselves. We're not trusting that anymore. We want to make sure that the pieces are convincing one another that they're trustworthy and that the hardware is trusted when it associates with the network, then that the user is trustworthy when they associate with the hardware. You do all that and you end up with a system where the security is enhanced. You know, we, I don't think we can say anymore that security is guaranteed. But what we can say is that we have enhanced security. And these days, that enhancement is what executives care about very, very deeply, especially since under the right conditions, they could end up going to jail if it's not enhanced. All right. Uh, when we come back, we're going to dive straight into Safe Boot with Steve Gibbs, and he's going to give us the absolute intimate details of what it means for us. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a break to thank the third sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, let me ask you a question Are you hiring? Well, if you do, you probably need talent fast, right? But it's not just a matter of finding the right person quickly. You also have to find the right person who's going to fit in with the culture of your business. There's nothing worse than hiring someone who just doesn't get it, doesn't fit, doesn't really buy into the corporate mission. These days, hiring is more than just about speed. You need to cast as broad a net as possible so that you can bring in all the qualified candidates, screen through them as quickly as possible, and then make the right choice. And that's why we're proud to have ZipRecruiter as part of the Twiat Riot. Now, ZipRecruiter understands that posting your job in one place just isn't enough anymore. If you want to find that perfect hire, you're going to need to post your, your job posting on all the top job sites. And that's what ZipRecruiter does for you. Now, with ZipRecruiter.com, you can post your job once and it gets placed on 50 plus job sites, including Craigslist, LinkedIn and Twitter, all with a single click. A ZipRecruiter will help you find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. And now ZipRecruiter offers Traffic Boost, which can get you up to three times as many qualified candidates for your job opening. There will be no juggling of emails or calls to your office at weird hours. Instead, you'll quickly scan candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. A ZipRecruiter has been used by over 200,000 businesses. Find out why today. Uh, right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. For a free four-day trial, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyad. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyad. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of This Week 
in enterprise tech. Steve Gibson, back to you. A large part of UEFI is this thing called Safe Boot. And, and Chibert, he's, he's in the chat with me. Uh, right now he's saying, you know, a lot of this is, is FUD. A lot of this is, there's a lot of fear going on that we're going to get locked out, that, that somehow this is going to reduce our choice. What's your take? What's the technical side of Safe Boot? Okay, so uh, Safe Boot appeared in, for the first time in version two, of the UEFI and is and and the spec has evolved. Uh, 2.31 is sort of the minimum UEFI level, which supports Safe Boot, for example, that Microsoft wants to have available for it. Um, I'm sure that listeners of the podcast are familiar with the the so-called PKI, the Public Key Infrastructure, for example, which manages security on the web. The, um, on the web, a web browser trusts a, a, an array of certificate authorities. Those certificate authorities sign certificates for web domains asserting the web domain's identity, that it really is who it says it is. Then when the browser goes to the web domain, the browser receives a certificate and thanks to the fact that the browser trusts the, the signatures of the certificate authorities, the browser is able to trust the signature on the certificate from the domain saying, I'm Amazon.com or eBay or PayPal or whatever. UEFI incorporates the same kind, the, all of those same principles of public key infrastructure in order to similarly trust device drivers and operating system components files can be uh, can, can can be signed essentially by by taking a hash of them and then you have a unique fingerprint for the file and then additionally you you can sign that hash with a certificate the the UEFI firmware actually maintains several databases that form both a whitelist and there's also a blacklist of, of signatures and hashes of firmware, um, add-on software, device drivers, and even the OS bootloader that it will or will explicitly not trust. So the way secure boot starts, you know, Windows calls it Windows 8 secure boot or Windows 10 secure boot, but... It, it's actually the latter stage. Windows is the latter stage. It plays an important part, but it all begins with UEFI because you have to be able to trust every single stage. And this is where, where um, Curtis and, and Chibert are talking about this chain of trust. The chain is a, is a series of interdependent loadings where you... You trust, you, you, you check the integrity of what you're about to load before you load it and give it control. And then it checks the integrity of the thing it's responsible for loading before it loads it and gives it control. So we start at the root with, with something known as the PK, the platform key in the UEFI firmware, which is a, it's a certificate that typically the manufacturer has. They use that certificate to sign their firmware. So the, the UEFI firmware itself contains a signature which is verified statically before the firmware is even run, before it has a chance to do anything. It's the, the, the motherboard itself makes sure nobody has tampered with it. That is, it is signed cryptographically by the motherboard's manufacturer. Then, and only then, it's allowed to run. Um, and then it continues that same process. Um, if you've got, for example, boards plugged in with option ROMs, in order for them to run in a UEFI motherboard, they need to either be signed by someone who has a trusted certificate preloaded in the firmware, or if if somehow the motherboard knows that it's uh, that it's a um, a, a legitimate option ROM. For example, if it was if it was an option ROM on the motherboard that 
that wasn't replaceable, but it was part of the built-in network interface adapters. Then, then instead, it wouldn't have to be signed, but its hash would be in the whitelist database, and that's just called DB in, in UEF, UEFI terms. The blacklist database is DBX, and those are any any signatures or or um, or certificates that are known not to be trusted are explicitly not allowed to run, even if they would otherwise be p properly signed. So, so basically, you know, this gives you some sense for the complexity that's been added to this. We've got a a full incremental step by step audited process. The auditing is the second part of this. It, it, it's called, there's safe boot and, um, shoot, what's the term? Um, it's, it's a strange word they used. Um, not managed, uh, measured, measured boot. At the same time that all of this is going on, there is an audit trail being created and stored in the trusted platform module, the TPM, that is, is part of this. And it is it is stored in a way that it cannot be tampered proof that it cannot be tampered with. It is tamper proof. With all this chain of trusted modules loading, finally the OS module, its signature is checked. The OS loader is allowed to run. Then, if if it, if it is a Windows operating system, they run something called ELAM, which is. Um, an early load anti-malware module, which comes in very early. Before the OS is even running, there's now anti-malware, which is looking for anything that doesn't look right as it continues to load the modules of the operating system. Once it's all finally done, as far as anyone, I mean, like we, we brought all the technology the industry currently has to bear, state-of-the-art crypto, signatures, cryptographic hashes that have to be signed, explicit whitelists and blacklists that allow any of this stuff to run at all. When it's all done, the, the trusted platform module can produce a signed audit, which is then sent outside of that machine. It might go, for example, to corporate IT um, monitoring to verify exactly what was done to boot this system. Because the presumption is if something did, was done wrong, it would arrange not to have itself be detected by its, by its own system. So the system can't trust itself, but there's no way to tamper with the audit. So that audit is sent outside of that machine. And for example, only if it is the audit proves that there's nothing funky happened at any point during boot, is that system then allowed to join the corporate intranet? So that's how complicated it's gotten. Wow. But if we do anything less, we know from experience, anything less, the bad guys will find a way to, to, to squeeze their malware into any little crack. So this is very much like, you know, when I've talked about iPhone... Uh, the, the Apple iPhone uh, version 7 and version 8 security, Apple has had to do the same thing in order to prevent all of the, all of the, the hacking of the phone because it's, that, it's such a ripe target. You've, you have to have, like from the, the, every single bit of code that runs is allowed to run. And now anyone can understand the problem with open source software, which isn't all cert certificized and signed and people are, you know, assembling their own source and building binaries, which won't have signatures. So all of that is completely in a, in a different dimension from this lockdown, cryptographically signed structure to make sure that nothing has a chance bad to get into your system. Uh, that's that's true. Trust no one computing. That's trust no one, <laughs> not even yourself computing. <laughs> not even your mother. Oh, you see, when you explain it like that, it, it demystifies a lot of UEFI and SafeBoot. So, so where where do we get all of the grumbling and all of the complaints of, well, uh, they're just doing this so that they can lock us out, so that we have to run Windows or we have to run Linux this version? Uh, when th th there seems to be so much of that fear, that that knee jerk fear, that you're not going to let me do with my hardware what I want to do. Well, there is ab there's absolutely a sense of 
sort of like this change of ownership. Who who actually owns this now? For example, um, Leo loves the fact that Android is as open as it is. You know, more arguably more open than the Apple um, iTunes App Store. Apple curates the apps that you are allowed, that you're permitted to run on the phone that you've paid a huge amount of money to have. So, so you know, is it yours or is Apple allowing you to use it? So, so when Microsoft came out with Windows 8, that was the first Microsoft-supported OS that would be able to leverage the secure boot facility that had already been in UEFI since version 2.31. So, I mean, we've had the secure boot technology sort of available, but OSs weren't really taking advantage of it. Microsoft decided with Windows 8, they were going to turn this on. Microsoft was, was aware that there could be some pushback from the industry. So, in order to get a Windows 8 logo on, on Windows 8 systems that were sold with Windows pre-installed, the manufacturer had to agree to ship the system with safe boot enabled, but to allow the user to manually turn it off. Obviously, it can't be allowed to be programmatically turned off right. or malware would just turn it off. So you, know, so you have to go through, you know, somehow get into the BIOS, navigate through the menus, find the option and say, yes, I am really sure I want to shut down my boot time security. Microsoft mandated that that be possible on the Windows 8 logo systems for desktops, not for mobile. Mobile, mobile has always been right. mobile has always been lock it down. That's just too dangerous an environment. So the everyone's concerns were a little bit assuaged because okay, so I got a system and it has Windows 8 installed and Safe Boot is enabled, but I can turn it off and, for example, run Spinrite on the system because. Uh, right now, Spinrite boots, you know, a, a version of FreeDOS that nobody has ever signed. So, so that was an advantage. What spooked people recently, and this is about five or six days ago, uh, in, in Shenzhen, China, during the, the recent uh, Windows Hardware Engineering Conference, WinHack, was one of the slides that talked about Windows 10 logo requirements said you must have UEFI of version 2.31 or later, and it, the system must ship with safe boot enabled. So that's the same. It said it, Windows 10 Mobile must not be disableable. The user must have no way of disabling this safe boot chain. And then the change was they said they would leave it up to OEMs whether laptop and desktop systems could have safe boot disabled. That is, they were, OEMs finally were given permission if they wanted to, which then this may be just like a death sentence for an OEM because it would cause so much back push. Um, but right. the OEM at its discretion could say, you know, those tech support calls we get from those Linux people are more trouble than they're worth. Or tech support p calls from people who turn off safe boot and then get themselves in trouble. We don't want those tech support calls. We're not going to let anybody turn that off. So this creates sort of another class of Windows machine. It's much more like a mobile phone. You can't change the operating system. You can't do, you, you really don't have the freedom that we have traditionally enjoyed for decades of, of PC-based hardware, of, of it being ours and being able to do with it what we want. If you buy a system with Windows 10 safe boot and, the, and will have, it will have safe boot and it will be enabled by default, you need to find out whether you can turn that off if you want to because right now, it's up to the OEMs themselves. Steve, I want to do one last go around. Let's let's start with you, Chibert. Uh, we've got people in the chat room like WebDude who's saying, so this is basically, this means that us Linux folks are, we're frozen out, right? We're, we're screwed here. 
That's I don't hear that's what Steve's saying. I mean, I, I right, hear not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, there are there are Linux OSs that do support safe boot. In fact, uh, and, what yep. they uh, uh, Fedora, OpenSUSE, and Ubuntu already support safe boot, and I'm, I'm sure that the rest will join as this becomes more and more popular. But but Chebert, where where do you stand? I mean, obviously you think a lot of the fear is just FUD, <clears throat> but is UEFI just a next logical extension? Is it where we are going to go? I think it's really going to be multiple classes of machines. Um, might I remind everybody how there is a vulnerability where you could actually just take a USB stick and stick it into an, ex, um, an easily exposed maintenance port on an automatic teller machine, and you've got the automatic teller machine. You Things like UFI were in part designed to keep things like that from happening because we want to be able to trust anything that touches financial information. Uh, so on one hand, UAFI has a lot of promise for being able to increase the amount of trust in anything that handles our money, anything that handles our health information. We want this. But yet, on the other hand, everybody keeps saying, well, we want to be able to run anything we want, even old legacy operating systems. And that's going to be an issue. So one of the things I threw out on the chat room is, well, if you do have some legacy um, applications that need older operating systems, you can always run one of the newer operating systems on that machine that does UEFI boot and safe boot and all that kind of good stuff. And let's run things like KVM or VMware or Microsoft Hyper-V, which actually comes free ever since Windows 8, um, and then run your legacy stuff under that. Right. Curtis, last question goes over to you. So push yourself out five years from now, uh, and you, you are, you're still broadcasting, you're still talking to executives, you're trying to get, guide their decisions. Is there a reason, a use case that you see that when, when, we, when we do these massive deployments, uh, forklift upgrades, if you will, of Windows 15 or whatever it's going to be by the time we get there, that UEFI wouldn't be just a standard option, something that you would automatically enable, something that you wouldn't even consider turning off because it allows you to keep that chain of trust, because it allows you to keep control of the workstations that are within your, your trusted network. No, I think in uh, in five years, if UEFI is not being used on pretty much every client machine that the enterprise buys, it will only be because something better has come along. Um, as Brian said, what we're ending up with is a different in the class of machines. For the class of machine that executives are looking to buy for the enterprise, UEFI makes absolutely perfect sense. Now, if you're doing something at home, if you're doing something in a lab, if you're doing something on an experimental basis, that's different. But if you have the kind of standard productivity workstation that enterprises tend to buy by the thousands, then UEFI is an absolute godsend because it does increase the security from one end to the other. It doesn't do anything bad to your manageability. And it ultimately makes those auditors and the people who come in from your outside legal counsel to make sure that you are defendable in court very, very happy. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for participating in this show. I'm sorry we have used up all of our time. That's right. You've used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten security auditors. I, I want to thank each and every single one of you for making this just such a fun, entertaining discussion. Let's start with you, Steve. Of course, we know that we can find you on Security Now here on the Twit TV network. And if if you want to know more and more in-depth information about things like UEFI and, and all the security issues that concern us, there's no reason for you not to go there. Where, where, when is that show, Steve? Um, we just uh, we just did episode 500 on Tuesday. We record every Tuesday at 1:30 Pacific time. 
And, and, uh, and of course, they're going to want to go to GRC.com. It's the home of everything from Shields Up, where you can check whether or not you're you're open to the internet, to uh, this to Spinrite, which is the best, the only indisposable tool that I think every PC person should have in his or her toolbox, and uh, something that's going to change security forever, which is Squirrel. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are? Because I know you're working furiously, but you, you never you never skimp on quality. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, we've got a, a bunch of people working away, uh, coordinated through uh, our, the news group, the Squirrel News Group at GRC. Um, just yesterday, I finished implementing and made some small changes to what we call the identity lock protocol. Um, there are many things that I think makes Squirrel superior to any other solution. For example, the big, the big competition is going to be FIDO, which is the big industry, you know, multiplayer consortium have put this thing together. But for example, Fido is is unable to do um, to, to do the kind of authentication that Squirrel can. It has to be multi-factor. Uh, with Squirrel, you can use it as as your sole identifier and authenticator. You, for example, you just say to the website, "This is my identity." And you're able to prove that that's your identity. With FIDO, the, your credentials are actually stored by the server. So you have to identify yourself like with a username and who you claim to be. Then the server sends you your credentials and then you verify that those are credentials that you're able to, to cryptographically satisfy and send them back. Whereas with Squirrel, the system is much simpler. Um, we have the ability to prevent your identity from being changed, but give you a secure means, which is unhackable, of changing your ID if you should ever want to. So I just finished up with that yesterday. Um, we're probably maybe a few weeks away from finishing. There is a client that's running. I've, I've got a demo server and diagnostics that are online that, that, that dump out the whole protocol. We've got people working on iOS and, and Android, uh, PHP, um, a whole bunch of server-side stuff and clients. So, you know, it's a big project, but it's coming along well. And the promise is that it completely replaces both usernames and passwords where it and and it could live side by side it doesn't have to replace fido even but in in the case of a username and password you could have a site where it says what your username and your password or there's a little qr code next to it you could snap that with your phone and then the page on the web page just instantly changes you're logged in end of end of story or if you don't want to use a phone you click on the qr code with your mouse and a squirrel client which is running in the machine picks up that scheme sqrl colon slash slash and logs you in in a secure fashion and it's absolutely cryptographically sound the idea being that one identity is all you need because every website sees you as a different entity but the same one every time you go back to that site so just changing the face of, of user authentication across the planet. But, you know, nothing, nothing real big is going on over there, I guess. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good day. I also want to thank my co-host, starting with Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. Of course, thank, thanks. You're, you're here in San Francisco. Hopefully I'll have time to come see you, according, uh, assuming, of course, I'm not infectious. Could you please tell the folks what you're up to and where they can find your work? Well, I am helping to build InteropNet, obviously, and Curtis and I are both going to take a little bit of time and talk about uh, the path on finishing the cloud security book and um, I'm enjoying myself answering questions in the chat room. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. And Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio, what awesome content do you have filling the pipeline right now? Well, one of the things that we're doing is the Hot Stage Diaries. This is a look behind the scenes here at Hot Stage, and it happens every day at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it's been going on all week, happens today, and then through all next week. Uh, follow me down here at, uh, this way, KG4GWA, because I tweet out the address over on Blog Talk Radio each and every day. Um, also, getting ready for... Interop itself after hot stage, you get to go home for uh, about two and a half weeks, and then we head to Las Vegas, and the fun begins all over again. 
Of course, this is normally the time where I thank the audience, because I do thank you, because we couldn't do this show without you. But something has preempted that thanks. And, uh, Alex, if you could go back to the Steve shot for a second. Steve, it is absolutely fantastic <laughs> that you hit 500 episodes of Security Now, but I think even a bigger milestone is the fact that we can wish you a happy big 6-0. My friend, happy birthday, and uh, it's great to have you on the Twit TV network. Thanks very much, guys. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Happy Alex. birthday, Steve. Thanks. Happy birthday, Steve. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Curtis. Now, folks, don't forget that we have a show archive. If you go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet, you'll be able to see all of our back episodes. That's right. We've got 133 episodes in the can right now. That's that's crazy. Wow, I didn't think we would get much faster past five but you can find out uh, the, the links for the stories that we talk about you can find out where you can find out more information about the guests that we have on each individual show you could even find out a, a place where you can get every episode downloaded automatically into your device of choice that's right if you want the audio version in your iphone maybe a, a video version in your tablet maybe the high definition version in your mac your pc your laptop your desktop you can find it all there at twit.tv slash quiet also don't forget that you can find me follow me on twitter at twitter.com slash Padre SJ. That's at Padre SJ. If you follow me there, you'll find out who our guests are going to be each week. You could suggest guests and topics for future shows, and you can find out what I do when I'm not in front of the camera. I, of course, want to thank everyone here at the Twit TV uh, studios who make this show possible, to Lisa, to Leo, to Carson, my super producer, and my ever-changing TD. I got to say, this one, this was a good TD. We've had... Himself, an Elf 3, that's right, Alex Gumpel was my TD for this episode. Alex, could you please say hello to the folks and tell them where they can find you on the Twit TV network? Well, normally you could find me uh, directing Know How and telling Padre he's out of time, which, by the way, we're, we're out of so time. out of time. <laughs> thank you, Alex. And thank you, folks. I'm Father Robert Ballasare. This has been This Week in Enterprise Deck. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in the Enterprise, just keep quiet. Mm -hmm.